morning, good evening, whatever it is, wherever you are YouTube. Well, it's a beautiful Saturday here. The whole country's on lockdown in quarantine and tomorrow's going to be even nicer. So, first questions first, what the hell am I doing out on a bike? Well, we can't actually get out on a bike, but due to the way that I shoot these videos, I can actually bring you some footage because when I'm doing bike reviews, I actually use two audio recorders. One records the bike and one records me. So by cunning use of old footage, I'm actually sat here in the garage looking like a complete turnip with my <gasps> helmet on my head because I want to make the sound as re realistic as possible. So this is Philo's Virtual Garage. The extended period that we're going to be sitting brings me onto the subjects uh, that people do have really varied opinions about, and that's fuel. Obviously, everyone's bike's been sitting for winter, everyone's just preparing to get them out, and now it looks like we could potentially have a month or even a couple of months where we can't ride our bikes. So, everyone likes to have conversations about fuel. There's myth, there's facts, and there's everything in between. This is just sort of my take on it especially as sliding through the back door is regulations and legislation that's going to increase the ethanol and fuel content in 2021. That's going to make E10, which is 10% ethanol, the standard across the board. So how does that affect us? Well, let's look at it. The use of ethanol in fuel actually stems from the American production of corn. Now, America makes vast, vast amounts of corn in the United States, and that's why huge amounts of product have corn in them. It's hidden in many, many different names. I'm going to put a few of these up here that are used in the food industry. So any of these names is actually a form of corn. And corn syrup and corn starch is not actually very good. And this is part of the reason for the huge amount of diabetes problems in the United States. But also, it gets refined into biofuels, specifically ethanol. So what actually is the problem with ethanol in petrol? Well, the main problems boil down to two things. Ethanol absorbs water, which eventually reaches the point it fills the petrol tanks with water with obvious problems. And also, ethanol can attack fuel pump seals, tanks, linings, all sorts of things like that. So that's simple, you'd have thought. I've got, for example, a 1986 Harley Davidson. According to Harley Davidson motorcycles, this bike can run an E10, so E5 certainly no problem. Well, it's not quite that straightforward. Unless you've owned the bike from new, how do you know the fuel lines haven't been changed? If those fuel lines have been changed, how do you know they're ethanol compatible? The list of problems that way just keeps going on. So, the other problem of course is water content gets drawn through into things like carburetor jets, and that can react with the brass, and that's where you get the block carburetors that are quite, pro quite prominent. So really, there's a couple of ways of dealing with this. Have you ever opened your garage door? found a really strong smell of petrol in the garage. That's a sign that one of the components in your petrol has broken down and actually escaped. Now, by nature, every petrol tank has a valve in it, they have to. And of course, when the petrol heats up, the, uh, the gases escape, but when it cools down, air has to go in to replace it. The petrol expands and traps. It's also the air that moves in and out of the tank. The problem is that what happens is that every time the tank heats up and it breathes out, it's breathing vapour-rich fumes out, and then when it brings breathes back in, it's bringing nice moist air in. The ethanol content absorbs that, the tank breathes out the nice dry air again, and again when the tank breathes in again, brings more moisture in. Now that effect can be quite dramatic, and I'm going to put up a few photos here. Now I recently purchased uh, off uh, my brother a little 125 using the pits when we're racing, and that had had 
uh, it just sat outside with a rather dodgy fuel cap seal. It had been predominantly covered, but this is how much water came out of the tank. And you can see here in some of the shots, you can see there's a clear difference between half water and half fuel, all fuel and all water. And there is some rust staining in it, although fortunately we didn't find any flakes, and there are no leaks in the tank either, which is really good news. But this is a really graphic illustration of how a bike you just left to sit can actually accumulate water in the tank. Now if you start to run a vehicle like this, you're going to end up with all sorts of problems. It's not going to start, it's going to try and draw, draw the water off first because the water sits under the fuel and it's going to rot the tank out from the seams. So what can you do about this? Well, there's a couple of things. For example, if you're going to sit the bike over winter, you can put a fuel stabiliser in. There are also some additives that will absorb water and they will help stabilise the fuel as well. You're going to need to check local legalities for those, but they will work. Also, pay attention to your garage. If you get extreme swings in temperature in your garage, that's going to create a bigger, for want of a better term, panting effect to the fuel tank, where it's breathing in and out. And of course, the more air that comes in, then the more moisture is going to come in with it. If you end up with a garage with lots of condensation in it, you've really got to watch your fuel tanks. And that, if that's the case, you may be able to drain them down. If your garage sits nice and dry, then and it's quite temperature stable, you may well not really have much of a problem. Now, my garage doesn't get any real condensation in it, and it stays remarkably stable because the, the roof is actually lined with plasterboard. So the actual temperature in the garage, although it gets hot during summer and cold during winter, doesn't swing enormously. So I don't get much condensation. I've never ever drained bikes down over winter, and I've never once had a problem. Now, if I've been in our fuel for a while, but there's also the question of which bikes can take the ethanol free fuel. Yamaha, since 1990, have had all of their bikes compatible with E10. If you ride a 1993 FZR600, or a 1992 FZR600, or anything like that, NAR1, NAR6, any of those sort of bikes, you're not going to have any problem with any of the fuel system. So, fuel lines, pumps, carburetors, things like that. The floats and that sort of thing are not going to dissolve with the ethanol of fuel. They've been designed to cope with it. Whether or not the tank will rust if it's sat for long periods of time from water contamination is a different matter. And the other question, have any of the parts been replaced? And if they have, are your replacement parts suitable for ethanol? It's all well and good saying, ah, oh, well, yeah, my float bowls aren't going to, reflect, aren't going to have a problem because the floats aren't going to react with the ethanol. But if your fuel lines are dissolving, you're still going to have a problem. Honda models from 1993 have all been E10 compatible. And as mentioned earlier, all Harley Davids from 1980. There's a really great website I'm going to put a link to down below, which has got a lot of information on what bikes can run E10. So the current legislation may not have the impact you think. How often are you using the bike is really also going to have an effect. The bike sat with fuel sat in the same tank in the same area for months and months on end. Yes, you're going to get a lot more problem. If the bike's being ridden and refilled every week, there's really not going to be a chance for, for water to form. Another reason I like to fill up with a full tank of petrol is that condensation forms inside fuel tanks. And by the basics of math and geometry, a full tank has a very small surface area, so there's only a very limited place that condensation can form. Whereas an empty tank or virtually empty tank has the entire area of that tank where condensation can form. This is going to have a massive effect on the amount of water in your fuel, so always fill up on the very last ride, ideally at the closest station within reason, especially if you can get some ethanol-free fuel. But it's also worth noting that some bikes, like my Honda CBR600, the skin of the tank is the skin of the tank. And of course that's going to be much more susceptible, because it's a steel tank to condensation, than the FZR, where it's actually a plastic cover with a steel tank inside it. Effectively what that's doing is giving it an extra layer of insulation, which does seem to make them just that little bit less susceptible. The shape of the tank will also contribute to the surface area as the fuel level goes down. The Yamaha's tank is really ideally shaped that when it's full, there is a very small surface area to volume ratio, which is naturally going to mean less water absorption over winter. So what are your options for ethanol-free petrol? At the moment, they're fairly limited. If you live anywhere other than the southwest of England, so Devon, Cornwall and potentially Somerset, you can actually get ethanol-free super unleaded through SO, SO4 quarts. Confusingly, the pumps are still labelled E5. That's because the, the certification for the fuel allows for up to 5% ethanol. It doesn't mean it actually has to contain it. 
So at the moment, SO is your safe bet. But in terms of older classic bikes, your best option is going to be to find someone that still sells four star and at least at the end of each season put a tank of that in it. So there you go, that's a few little, little ramblings as we ride through the, the lovely Northamptonshire countryside, albeit just in a virtual capacity. Um, that's my take on fuel, so basically just, just, you know, what I do, leave the bikes full, I try and put a full tank of ethanol free petrol in. Going forward with the introduction of E10, Super on the is still going to retain at most 5% ethanol, so I would now recommend all bikes of all ages just run on Super Unleaded. Ultimately, bikes for most people are toys, especially higher powered ones, and if 5 or 10 PL is really a factor, maybe it's worth downgrading a bike site to something that's a little bit, little bit more of a safety margin for you. But the reality is the cost on a bike tank is the cost of a miles bar realistically each fill up, so it's really not enough to concern yourself with. And certainly the cost of repairs if you do end up with damage through ethanol, for example, for a tank, is, is going to be vastly more expensive. 5% ethanol fuel is unlikely to cause any major problems unless there is other underlying contributing factors like the storage conditions, like the cap seal, uh, and likewise a little bit of fuel stabiliser never hurts either. So unfortunately it's one of those questions where there is no straight answer. Um, does this help? Well, not really. And is the situation going to keep changing? Yeah, it is, because ultimately it's likely we'll end up with 10% ethanol everywhere. Is this likely to change with the UK leaving the EU? Nobody knows. At the moment, the mandated level is 5% ethanol, and 10% ethanol is optional rather than mandatory. Leaving the EU, of course, means that we may align ourselves with American standards, which is like to increase rather than decrease the ethanol in our fuel, as Americans seek to dump their corn crops in bioethanol. So, the question, who knows what the answer is? All I know is that I've been using E5 in my Yamaha and Noah with no problems. Uh, my Yamaha is in 1990, so in theory it should be able to run E10. Haven't had an issue. I will start putting a few stabilizers in it and I'm not going to deliberately choose E10. I'd never recommend deliberately choosing E10 because there is no advantage to it. So I would definitely now only run super unedited in everything. And fortunately I have an SO station that is only about three miles from me. So the CBR on the Benelli, I'm going to be filling up there every time. So, well there you go. Not super helpful, but what can you do? Uh, if you like these videos, do hit the like and subscribe button. Hit the comment section as well. I know this is going to ignite a whole load of people saying, no, ethanol is terrible, it dissolves everything. But it's going to be the compatibility issue. What I do urge you to do is quickly look through the list and the link down below. See if your bike's rated as one of the ones that will take E10. But again, the question mark remains, even if your bike's on that list, has it had the fuel lines changed? Are those lines compatible? And has it had a tank sealer added, like the cream and things like that, the tank two-part sealing systems? If it has, are those unleaded uh, or ethanol compatible? Really hard to know. It's a total minefield and sadly ain't going to get any easier. In the meantime, hit the like and subscribe button, and I'll see you soon. Hopefully when things return back to normal.